I want to start with you. I want to ask you a question. How many of you are not from Los Angeles? It's pretty much everybody, right? <laughs> Me neither.、Um, we're not alone. We live in a country of people from someplace else. So, as a cultural psychologist, I'm extremely interested in why people from different cultural backgrounds fight and what we can do about it. How we can all get along better. And、um, as a psychologist, you've probably heard psychologists、uh, tend to study the problems in their own lives. And so, I'm going to tell you why I'm interested in cultural psychology, the clashes I've encountered.、Um, so, I grew up in a really faraway, exotic land called Memphis, Tennessee. Perhaps you've heard of it. We have elaborate rituals worshiping the ghost of Elvis Presley, and because I was raised by a working-class mother, well, not、uh, I was raised by a single mother in a working-class community, and I seldom left the South. I really didn't see much of the world until、uh, the age of 18, when I went to Yale University, way on up in New Haven, Connecticut, the land of the Yankees, the land of the rich, the land of a lot of things I had never experienced before. Um, and then I was always packing up my bags. Of course, the neighbors and the, my family came over to give me advice, including this lady. That's my grandmother. And、uh, as a parting gift, she gave me this sign to hang in my dorm room: "Better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak out and remove all doubt." And at the time, this seemed like really good advice to me because, after all,、uh, I do like to talk a lot,、um, but I don't want to bring shame to my family. And also, I was starting to be aware of the stereotype of Southerners as being sort of slow and backward and dim-witted, and I didn't want to give anybody any more reason to believe that. So, for the first three years I was at Yale, I, I really didn't talk that much.、Um, but I'm pretty sure none of my classmates got this sign because、um, this is Yale, a very beautiful place, very different from where I grew up.、Um, I was surrounded by people who could not stop telling me about their excellent ideas. And actually, some of them really were excellent ideas. For example, hey, why don't we take the San Francisco Bay Bridge and turn it into a large light sculpture? Good idea. But some of the ideas weren't so great, such as why don't we set the greatest hits of Barry Manilow to a mime opera on ice? <laughs> Not a good idea. But regardless of the quality of people's ideas, they were constantly telling them about me, telling me about them, and indeed they would interrupt me to tell me their ideas. And if they disagreed with me, sometimes they would get up in my face and say, "You're wrong." This is really hard for a Southerner, because one stereotype is true about the South: we are very polite. We do say yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. We say please. We say thank you. And if someone puts a finger in our face, we assume that they need it broken. And as a result, <laughs> the South is both the most polite and also the most violent region in the country. And so here I was, not really talking much in class,、uh, kind of bewildered by my classmates, and worried that the admissions committee had made some terrible error, and starting to suspect that maybe the stereotype was right—that Southerners are slow and backward and dim-witted. But I started looking around, a nascent cultural psychologist, at the other people at Yale who were having troubles, and I noticed that、uh, actually there weren't that many people from working-class communities, and the ones that were there were dropping out. And I noticed that not just the Southerners, but also the Midwesterners, were having trouble with this agonistic, combative style that we were meant to adopt. And I noticed that even my Asian American friends were having trouble speaking up in class and sharing their individual brilliance. And I noticed that my African American friends and my Latino friends were also really kind of worried about confirming these bad stereotypes about their groups. So I, I felt like I had my hand on the tail of an idea of a pattern I was seeing in the world, and this is what you do as a social scientist. But I didn't really know what words to put onto it until I went away to grad school. I hooked up with this、uh, pioneer in cultural psychology named Hazel Rose Marcus, and Hazel helped me describe kind of what this pattern was. And what I came to understand through my studies was that my family, my southern family, and my working class community really wanted me to work on. And I'm sorry, the red is blending in. It says interdependent. They wanted me to really work on my interdependent side. That I needed to work on my relationships with other people. I need to figure out how I'm similar to you and how I can connect with you and how I can fit in with you. I need to stay rooted in place, in tradition, and in history. And this is what a good person does. But at Yale and later at Stanford and among upper middle class people and on the East Coast and the West Coast, people really wanted me to be independent. They wanted me to be individual, to stick out. To be autonomous, 
to be unique, to be free of place, free of tradition, and free of history. And I was really inter so interested in this divide between independence and interdependence, and I saw it in so many different places that I spent the fast, past five years working with Hazel Rose Marcus to write this book, Clash, Eight Cultural Conflicts That Make Us Who We Are. And in the book, we review hundreds of studies from across the social sciences, law, medicine, business, to show that certain cultures emphasize independence and other cultures emphasize independence. And so in the left-hand column, the cultures that emphasize independence include the West writ large, male culture, white culture, middle class culture, the East and West Coast of the United States, mainline Protestants, these are your Anglicans, your Congregationalists, your Methodists, um, business culture is very independent. The global north, the wealthier countries of the global north. But on the other hand, interdependent cultures include the East writ large, female culture, non-white culture within the US, working class culture, the South and the Midwest, conservative Protestants, that includes fundamentalists and evangelicals, Catholics, Jews, uh, nonprofits and governments, and also the poorer countries of the global South. Now, looking at this, you probably notice a couple of things. First of all, none of us has just one culture. Each of us is the crossroads of many different cultural forces. Um, and some of them are independent, and some of them are interdependent. And a big part of what we do as human beings, one of our smart human tricks, is reconciling all these different cultural forces within ourselves. But you can also imagine that this is where conflicts come from, this clash of independence and interdependence. Click through. So one of these conflicts that we encounter every day is the clash of women and men. I'm not an astronomer, but I want to tell you that women are from Earth and men are from Earth. There are very few stable, robust, significant, biological, innate, hardwired differences between men and women. But there are a lot of cultural differences. And the cultural differences give us stats like this. In the US, women now earn more undergraduate and advanced degrees than men. We hold more professional and managerial positions. We own our half and 47% of US firms. Yet we still earn 77 cents per a man's dollar. We are only 3.6% of the Fortune 500 CEOs and only 17% of US Congress. So why is that? This is the Southern question we ask in social science. Why is that? And there's a lot of things going on. Obviously, this is a complicated social phenomenon, but the way that independence and interdependence in their clash plays out is simply men are not using their interdependent side, not exactly rolling out the red carpet in many cases. There's still rampant discrimination, rampant harassment, and that's one half of the equation. But the other half is women are not really flexing their independent side. We don't insist. And let me tell you a story that I recently, from my own life, I had to negotiate my salary. Um, and so I'm meeting with my boss. And I know what I'm supposed to do, right? We've all done this. You know you're supposed to talk about your individual contributions and your unique talents, how the whole company is going to fall apart if you leave. But what I'm thinking also is, oh, this is so awkward. I so don't want to crow about myself to my boss. I'm also thinking about all my coworkers and how awesome they are and how good we work together, as a, how well we work together as a team, right? And so these interdependent concerns hold me back. And research shows that, indeed, many women ask for less in their opening offer and stick with the negotiation for less uh, turns and walk away with less um, because we have these interdependent concerns. A similar example. Asian Americans, very similar situation. Right now, Asian Americans are 5% of the US population, yet they fill 15 to 45% of undergraduate seats at our top universities. Yet, there are only 1.4% of Fortune 500 CEOs who are Asian American, and there are only 2% of the US Congress. And once again, we see the clash of independence and interdependence at play. In many Asian cultures, leadership and being smart means listening and being calm. And that way, you can actually pay attention to the other person, hear what they have to say, relate to them, meet their needs. But in US culture, leadership and being smart means talking and being excited, leading the way, having the vision, showing the new path. And so when Asian Americans come up for promotions and, and raises, it's the same problem. It's like, well, where's the leadership here? And in both the case of women 
and, and Asian Americans in business when women and Asian Americans do not get those powers, those higher positions, everybody loses because research is now showing that the more diverse an organization, both in terms of ethnicity, socioeconomic status, background, and gender, um, the more successful the organization, the higher its profits, the bigger its market, and the higher its morale. So maybe you're sitting there and saying, okay, I get it. This morning I thought I just had one self, now I have two selves, they're conflicting. What do you want me to do about it? Do I need two therapists? Do I need one for my independent self and one for my interdependent self? What do I do with this information? I think my, my first message is actually both more hopeful and more cost-effective. This morning when you woke up, you probably thought you had a bunch of problems, right? You thought you had a problem maybe with your spouse, maybe with your in-laws, with your boss, your coworker, your neighbor, that ex-best friend back home. I'd like to propose that maybe you just have one problem, that in five different or ten different varieties, which is this clash of independence and interdependence. And I'd like to leave you with a very simple strategy for handling these conflicts in your own life. If you find yourself having conflict with someone, the first thing to do is don't just assume that they're a jerk. They, they may very well be a jerk, but assume that maybe you're having some kind of cultural conflict. And try interdependence. When we're being interdependent, we pay more attention to other people, we try to connect with them, we see our similarities, we build the common ground. And we do, when we do that, we're much more likely to figure out what the problem is and perhaps also resolve it. But if that doesn't work, Try independence. You have 100% more psychological resources than you actually think it, many of you might realize. Um, and so when we're independent, independence is really great when you need to think outside of the box, do things different, break with tradition, innovate. Also, when you are being oppressed or a system is unfair, independence forces us to think of a different way of being. And we need both, and here's a picture that shows why. This is a satellite image of our planet. And all those lines are our airline routes, our, our shipping routes, and our railroad routes. And as you can see, we are deeply connected to everyone else on this planet. We're deeply interdependent. But because of our interdependence, because of our success as a species, there's so many of us, we are actually jeopardizing the very planet we live on. And to save ourselves from ourselves, we will need to innovate we will need to be able to go from independence and to interdependence and back again flexibly so that we can survive and also thrive in the 21st century. Thank you.